I am Anchita Vinayar, a co-founder and CEO of Culture. We are a creative startup that's trying to make art, culture, and heritage more accessible. Uh, cultural institutions play an important role in connecting and building a community through participation, access, cultural consumption, and inclusion. Institutions are rethinking and redesigning their environments to bring together audiences from various backgrounds. Today, we will talk about addressing the possibilities and challenges of cultural engagement in spaces like museums, galleries, exhibitions, and educational institutions. We have with us Ketri Varma. She is the Associate Director for Programs at Asia Society India Center, a global not-for-profit network uh, of centers across the world committed to building awareness about arts, culture, business, and policy from Asia. Uh, she is an arts administrator, project manager, and researcher with experience in cultural programming, project management, and art writing. She has worked with several not-for-profit cultural organizations in India and abroad to further their mandate in the arts by conceptualizing and executing cross-disciplinary initiatives for public engagement and building long-term strategies for audience development. Uh, welcome, Keithki. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of our talk series. Thank you for inviting me and thanks to Culture and the Center for Museums. It's great to be a part of this series. Okay, so let's, I have a few questions uh, uh, written down, so let's just dive right in. Sure. Uh, cultural institutions in India have played a pivotal role in the revitalization, interpretation, and documentation of heritage and arts, as well as in facilitating citizens' interaction and engagement with heritage and arts. What are the major beneficial changes you have seen in cultural institutions over the course of your almost decade-long involvement in programming and engagement in the arts? Uh, great question. And I think there are many um, answers to this and also many uh, provocations uh, or further questions that emerge from it. But I think before I get into specifics, and I apologize to everyone for this long winded answer that, that uh, I'm going to give, I think it might be useful for me to uh, provide a little overview of this journey that I've had working in the cultural sector. Um, I think it'll help provide context for this conversation in general. Um, so I studied arts management formally for my master's in London, and that was an interesting experience because on the one hand, uh, it introduced uh, to me concepts like cultural policy, uh, cultural diplomacy, the relationship between culture and the city, uh, the economy of culture. Um, but it also taught me that the only way one can really understand the cultural sector is by getting your hands uh, and feet wet and working in it. Um, theoretical knowledge can only take you that far especially in a place like India, I've discovered, or South Asia even uh, more broadly. <clears throat> and so I've spent the past eight or so years immersed in the sector, uh, working with organizations, mostly uh, non-profits and different kinds of people, um, artists, but also funders, strategists, other arts managers, and other relevant stakeholders. Um, and my range of experience has been fairly wide. So when I was in London, for instance, I worked briefly with a small community center in this place called Bethnal Green, which is in East London, where I helped develop uh, one of their community theater programs. Um, and that was a very small sort of uh, community led uh, organization. Um, and simultaneously, I was also commissioned to write an audience development report for an organization called Tara Arts, uh, a theater group, for one of their touring um, uh, projects. And that was a totally different experience because it required primary research, it involved writing, it involved academic study, th and thinking about things like audiences in the making of or a promotion of uh, cultural work. Um, when I came back to India from London, I started working at Serendipity Arts Foundation. And at the time, there was no foundation, there was no team, there was nobody. Um, and it was basically starting something entirely from scratch. And that involved a process of, of learning or unlearning or relearning um, as I familiarized myself with the nuances of the cultural sector. And my biggest takeaway was that to realize and deliver a cultural project, you have to learn um, a whole lot more than just the art. Uh, you have to know how to communicate your project. You have to, you need to be able to do things like uh, admin work, emails. You need to be able to do production. Uh, you need to do some amount of event management. You need to look at things like uh, travel logistics or finance, which you may not be interested in at all. Um, and you need to be able to sustain the project, build and sustain the project. So you need to look at funding and working with donors and donor management. 
Um, and then I worked a bit with an online uh, magazine um, before coming to my current role at Asia Society's India Center, uh, where I now lead programming. And Asia Society is both totally different from and similar to my past experiences in that it has a longer history and legacy because it was something that was set up in the US in the 1950s and over time has grown to become a network of 14 centers across the world. Um, uh, but having said that, I mean, it's been in India for 15 years, but right now we've been in this moment since the pandemic hit of kind of taking a step back and redeveloping the center's identity, thinking a little more uh, critically and deeply about the role of an organization like Asia Society, which is not only a cultural institution, uh, because it curates and delivers programs across, you know, business and economics, national and regional geopolitics, public policy, health, education, technology, and, and arts and culture. Um, and, and so that's kind of my background. Um, and I think that uh, coming back to your question about um, you know, what are some of the changes that I've seen in cultural institutions over the course of this uh, journey? First, uh, there have been many changes that have happened in general. So one is that there's been a change in tastes, expectations, and interests of audiences. That's a big one. Um, the other thing is the philanthropic priorities of funders is constantly developing. And that's something that uh, that institutions need to think about. Uh, the composition of communities from which the sector draws its support, um, and this could be geographic communities, this could be uh, different socioeconomic communities. Um, the economy is a big one, you know, income and wealth distribution, budget allocation towards the arts, um, both by private players and public players. Uh, long, long standing competition for leisure time in India, you know, when you have theaters and parks and things like that. Um, and then, of course, new and transformational technologies that are available for the creation and distribution of creative content. Uh, and that's been a big one that has come up, particularly over the past decade. Um, and then the continuously see, shifting. Yeah, sorry. sorry. When you say taste has changed over the uh, past uh, decade, what exactly do you mean? Like, I mean, uh... So I think it's been in conjunction with some of these other things. So for instance, um, you know, as technologies have changed, uh, people are interested in different things in different ways. So for instance, I mean, even uh, if you if you look at say film, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the rise of OTT, the way people experience film or content has changed. Right. Similarly, the more uh, cultural institutions that exist in a city or in a locality, people will engage with them differently. Um, uh, there's a there's a uh, certain interest in in a certain social topics that people have now. So you know, given the climate change is such a big uh, issue of our times, people are interested even in the art space in engaging with art that looks at climate change. Um, so those are the kinds of changes that are happening, and of course, there are also political changes that are happening simultaneously. Um, so that's what I mean by by tastes okay. of audiences. Okay. Um, and, and then, of course, shifting modes of artistic practice, which which is not something new, which has always happened, but that that's right. also part of this. And so in terms of cultural institutions specifically, I think what's happened uh, that I've noticed, and this is completely uh, based on my own personal experience, and you know, people may agree or disagree, um, but I feel like the scope and definition of cultural institutions has expanded. So what you don't necessarily need to define a cultural institution as something that has, for instance, a physical infrastructure. It could be just a collective that exists online. Um, you know, it doesn't need to only be a museum or a gallery or a festival or a fair. It could be a mix of, of these things. It could involve uh, both public and private uh, players in it. It could be uh, uh, it could be a commercial enterprise with a non-profit uh, wing to it. You know, there are all kinds of uh, permutations and combinations that have come up. And I think thinking broadly about cultural institutions is, has been a really beneficial thing. Um, the, the other thing, and also different kinds of institutions. So for example, a culture. Uh, has come up, you know, or you have places like, you know, the Artex company, uh, which does something completely different for the for the cultural sector. Um, so, so those kinds of uh, organizations are really interesting. Uh, there's a move in India, I've noticed, beyond the big cities, beyond the Delhi, Bombay, Kolkata, Bangalore. That that has happened a lot I, I, since I started. Um, technology, like I mentioned, and I'm sure we'll get to that in more detail uh, later. 
Um, and at a personal level, I feel like there's been a lot more community building between art professionals. I don't know whether this is this this is necessarily something new or whether I feel like I'm noticing it a lot more now, having been in the sector for this long. Maybe when I was younger, I didn't even realize. Uh, but I feel like that's really good because um, there's a sharing of ideas. There's creations of forums like these, you know, these talk series. Uh, where you can share best practices and talk a little bit about what is important for the Indian context, for the South Asian context, and not necessarily imitate sort of Western modes of uh, disseminating culture. Um, there's also, I feel there was a whole phase in the middle where it was all about interdisciplinarity, which of course has continued, but I feel like now there's almost a move towards and like a non or anti disciplinarity where you don't even have to think about discipline as a category at all. You right. know, it's irrelevant to the type of cultural institution. Um, and, you know, actually the topic of this uh, uh, talk is, is hits the nail on the head because really cultural institutions are catalysts. That is their role in society. And that has always been their role, but I feel like there's more, there's been a move towards defining it as such. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and especially in response to this need to kind of straight jacket them in into one specific mandate or one specific type of uh, uh, institution. So I feel like um, uh, that's really, th those are the changes that I've seen over, over the past few years. Right. Uh, museums and other cultural institutions are facing complex challenges and uh, boundaries are being blurred with multidisciplinarity, like you said, in order to become more effective. How is this approach working in Asia Society India Art, India Center? Can you tell us about your any upcoming projects that you're working towards at the moment? Sure. So, I mean, first a quick caveat, uh, as I'm sure you have realized, I'm not a museum professional. So I've never, I've never been one. I've never worked at a museum. Uh, I've been a keen visitor of museums and I've worked tangentially on museum projects. I've written about them. Uh, but my perspectives in some sense comes from the outside. Um, when you talk about boundaries getting blurred, I mean, one is between disciplines and that I think for Asia societies, uh, for Asia society, that's, that's a historical legacy of, of the Asia society. It's never only looked at one type of discipline, um, uh, both within arts and culture and between the arts and other, other uh, fields of work. Um, the other focus for us in terms of blurring boundaries is blurring geographical boundaries. And I think that's something that we, the India Center has taken up as a mandate now, particularly over the past uh, two years in the pandemic, where, where you know, technology has opened things up so much um, that we are, we've now kind of redefined our identity to become a um, a center and a hub for South Asia and not just for India, even though it's still called the India Center. Um, Asia Society is a network of 14 centers across the world. Um, and it's a, it's a nonprofit uh, network. And we're the only ones in the subcontinent. So in, in some sense, we feel like it's an imperative almost to uh, respond to the region and to think about, uh, you know, common concerns, uh, you know, think critically and deeply about common concerns and also engage with people and institutions and ideas that that belong to all of us and that are relevant to us. Um, so, and, and again, to blur boundaries, I think, you know, one thing that is really important is collaborations. And that's something that we're trying to do more and more. So, for instance, the India Center doesn't, we don't have our own separate building at the moment. Uh, and since the pandemic, we've been working remotely. We're continuing to do so, even though we're still, we're back to in-person programming. But we feel like we don't, given that our role is as a catalyst, we don't feel the need to then do everything by ourselves. You know, collaboration is key. Uh, it is important to keep working with people who are in the same field. And yeah. in some sense, you're working towards the same broader goals. Um, so that's been a really big part of uh, what we're doing and, and uh, uh, responding to our projects. Um, we have one exhibition which is on view right now. It's on till the 4th of uh, December. It's an exhibition that we've uh, developed jointly with the Kiranadar Museum of Art in Delhi. So whoever's in Delhi, please do go visit. Um, and um, so that's something that we've, it's the first kind of thing, exhibition that we've done entirely uh, uh, on our own as the India Center in collaboration with another museum. Um, and, um, uh, you know, as part of that, we also have a public program that, that is coming up day after tomorrow uh, uh, to support the exhibition. Um, but we're also, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to think of new forms of engagement, keeping in mind our stakeholders. So we're a membership based organization, which means that we um, have to think about our, our different tiers of members and also public audiences and balance the two. Uh, so in the arts, I mean, I, I'm 
focusing on the arts for the purpose of this talk. Um, in the arts, we're looking at next year developing something that we started this year, which is on craft and vernacular artistic traditions. Um, so the series is called In Practice, Building New Vocabularies for Craft. And we're going to do a whole series of in-person and virtual programs, which includes you know, webinars and panels, but also uh, strategic roundtables with stakeholders and also immersive experiences, visits to craft sites and so on. And so that's something we're going to develop next year. Um, we are also going to have our annual Asia Arts Game Changer Awards, which we do every year anyway. Um, we are possibly going to do another exhibition. Um, we have these things that we do uh, with a select group of people called cultural caravans. Um, we also have a focus on collectors and collection building um, in India and South Asia. So uh, that's a smaller roundtable, private roundtable series that we're doing uh, called Conversations with Collectors. So there's a whole bunch of things in the pipeline yeah. that we're Cultural developing. Cultural caravan sounds very interesting. What, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> so this is something for a select group of people that uh, we do, where basically the idea is to visit uh, a, a place or a site of cultural relevance um, anywhere. And, and it could be affiliated to, you know, if, if for instance, the Kochi Biennial is happening to go there. Uh, but basically, we will curate these experiences for people. Um, uh, and we have a group of cultural ambassadors who are a part of this circle, basically. And what, what it involves is, is getting to know different people in the sector. And so communicating, networking with them, but also getting to experience uh, the culture of a particular place. Okay. Uh, one of the focus areas for Asia society globally is museums. Uh, three centers have their own museums as well. And there have been conferences and other programs dedicated to museums. Could you tell us a bit more about those and uh, the India Center's engagement with these? So, uh, yes, we have three museums, one in New York, uh, one in Houston, and one in Hong Kong. Um, and these are museums in the sense that are physical, there are physical buildings, basically, and they, they have exhibitions through the year. Um, uh, we, like I mentioned earlier, we don't have one in India, our own space, uh, but we are still trying to present exhibitions as much as possible. Collaborations are a part of that. Um, and we want to do more and more collaborations with museums and whether that's in the form of exhibitions or in, even in terms of public programming or anything of that sort. Uh, again, our role is as catalyst. So wherever we can play that role, we would want to uh, do that. Um, uh, the, the other big thing that the Asia Society Museum in New York runs um, is the Arts and Museums Summit which has been happening biannually for, for a few years now. And that is basically, it brings together museum and cultural re leaders from across Asia, uh, the United States and Europe to discuss the key questions that they face. Um, so it pr provides an open forum for the exchange of capacity building knowledge, um, uh, you know, relating to Asian arts, broadly speaking. Um, and so it has lectures, it has uh, uh, panel discussions and so on. And Last year, it happened virtually uh, in 2021. And so next year, it's going to happen again. And the 2019 version of the summit was done in collaboration with the India Center. So, uh, and that was on collecting practices in the 21st century. So that was a that was a very exciting summit. And so we are planning to do, you know, more and more um, as the India Center with our three global museums and as part of the summit and also just in the region. Um, I think, you know, even in terms of, spotlighting museum practices in India and South Asia is uh, is a good thing because, you know, just, just to make people aware of the kinds of museums and museum practices that exist in the region. Yeah. Uh, how, you talked about your experience with Serendipity Arts Foundation in establishing the foundation and building a diversified arts space. What were the uh, Serendipity Arts Foundation's initiatives that brought about the multidisciplinarity that we were talking about in the arts space? Right. So um, uh, in 2015, when uh, when I joined um, the one person who was at Serendipity at the time, um, the mandate was basically to uh, recognize that in India or South Asia, um, the arts have never really been separate from one another. This is a Western thing of having, you know, dance, music, 
art as all separate things. Um, in our culture, traditionally, all the arts have been together. We see dance and music in conjunction. We see visual art in conjunction with music, uh, theater, all of that. So, um, so the idea was to build uh, a festival that would bring all of these art forms in one space so that you don't sit, need to go to a dance festival or you don't need to go to a visual arts you know, festival and things like that. That was the mandate that we began with and it began really small um, and then over time um, it kind of grew into what it has become today and I can only speak to you know the three and a half years that I was there um, but uh, what we decided to do was we we decided to say that okay if this is our mandate how do we uh, uh, build it from scratch in the sense get a curatorial team of experts together and rely on them to figure out what the gaps in the sector are and how a festival like this can fill them. So, so when we're talking about interdisciplinarity, initially it was basically about multidisciplinarity. So even bringing the disciplines into one space. Hmm. Over time, it transitioned into thinking more about, okay, we, don't, we, we may have uh, dance performances and music performances and and an exhibition side by side but how do we in, uh, make them intermingle and how do we uh, present them uh, as one unit to audiences um and how do we uh, and then it and then thinking about you know how do we engage uh, local audiences so the the festival happens in goa mm -hmm. uh, but it i mean i initially the the idea was that you can't uh, go to a place and and use all its resources and use its infrastructure and leave. So how do you effectively uh, engage with people where it, it becomes so seamless that you don't talk about, you know, community engagement. It, it happens as, as, uh, as uh, uh, organically as possible. Um, and um, and so, uh, so that's how the journey of disciplinarity began with serendipity and over time it's grown. And then thinking about, okay, uh, physical or in-person uh, modes of dissemination are one way to go, but how do you also have, uh, uh, how do you use the virtual space in a more effective way? How do you bring in people, not just from India, but also other parts of South Asia? How do you bring in international people? How do you share uh, best practices? So, so that's basically how that experience uh, developed. Um, in cultural organization and spaces like museums, galleries, and in educational institutions, what are the different modes of engagement that are adopted to drive audience towards the understanding of visual culture, heritage, and its uh, education? Um, yeah. Right. So, um, so again, I mean, I can only speak from the perspective of the cultural institutions that I've worked with, oh, mostly yeah. nonprofits. Um, uh, but I think the different modes of engagement, I think one important um, uh, lesson has been that there's no one size fits all when you when it comes to thinking about uh, modes of engagement in the arts. Each organization has to think about what its audience is, what its team is, what are its strengths, and what is its mandate. And for the longest time, you know, I rebelled against this uh, vision and mission uh, idea of having to articulate exactly what you want to do in, in the space of two sentences. But I've come to realize the benefits of that because uh, what that does is it allows you to really be ambitious without um, straying from your path too much. So you So it allows you to then think big, and think small, both at the same time, because you have to do that in a cultural institution. You have to think long term, think strategy, but also think about what you need to do every single day. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's one thing. The uh, no one size fits all. And in terms of um, uh, forms of engagement, I mean, I mean, you know, there's obviously public programs that one curates, which includes anything from panel discussions to talks to. Um, uh, lectures, conferences, that kind of stuff. You also have, you know, when you have um, uh, festivals or exhibitions, you have curatorial walkthroughs. Um, and that's a really good way to kind of engage audiences because you can have different kinds of audiences. And it's more about being in touch with the artwork. Um, uh, and it, the, the person who walks you through it is just a mediator in some sense. Um, then you have, you know, technology-driven initiatives now that have come up. And I feel especially in the pandemic, as a response to the pandemic, there were so many online communities that got built just as fundraisers. And they used art as a medium to do that, which was lovely. Um, you have educational uh, initiatives, you have your workshops and, and um, uh, 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 
conferences for students and you know things like that but again i think it's all about thinking about who your target audience is so for a particular museum they might say that you know the museum is open to all it's a public museum in that sense but um how do we get more and more people into the museum we might uh, say that okay we'll have a whole section dedicated to kids and so you develop programs for children similarly for at asia society it's important for us to think about who our key stakeholders are so we have we have a we have a um uh, mission to uh, be a public educational or awareness building platform right so a lot of what we do is cater to the public and uh, it's for a more general sort of audience but we also have groups of members who are interested in specific parts of what asia society has to offer and so for them we might curate smaller round tables so we might have opportunities for them to network or interact with uh, people who are relevant to their field um and and the third thing is that we try to build uh, bridges or networks between people who um may not uh, 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 we might we try to facilitate those bridges between people who can't uh, who who may not normally think of doing so so we might try to uh, make you know arts and culture meet policy meet business and and figure out if there are ways to uh, 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 groom that right you know uh, what you were talking about you know engaging uh, kids in a different way or, or you know the education space we at culture that's what we are also trying to sort of do exactly uh, for example uh, as an institution archaeological survey of india could could actually be do so much uh, and uh, you know what we are trying to do is facilitate that you know people do not know what archaeologists do and or or uh, you know what happens you know we what we learn in books in history that could be made experiential and that's what we tried with our uh, archaeological kit you know the harappan archaeology kit and right. we realized that people engage with uh, an experience or a, a you know engagement um, model much more than just regular content or text and things like that. and that's what i think what you were talking about digitally also technology people are engaging with monuments through ar vr and it's exactly. a really exciting time to sort of uh, be in the art space yeah. absolutely and also thinking about i mean places that uh, so one of the biggest challenges is how do you get people to go to museums in the first place right yeah. so in that case how why can you not bring museums to people or yeah. forget museums but even just art um, projects Yeah. two people so if if for instance in delhi if people are visiting lodi garden or sundar nursery or wherever is there a way for us to uh, present art and culture in those spaces uh, for people to be able to engage with them very naturally and then then that conversation then people might you know visit museums or figure uh, figure out how to engage with the arts further um so and, so that's great yeah and in india also such exciting things are happening like for example sarmaya hmm. how they we started engaging with audiences by being completely virtual and uh, you know creating art through art it's it's amazing what they do on their social media uh, so the pandemic years have changed the way society engages things are now more digitally driven and there has been an increase in audience engagement through multiple digital media and platforms what are your thoughts on the digital engagement of art specifically i mean i think it's great i think of course it's uh, amazing and i think the the initiatives that have come up uh over the past over the past two years in the pandemic but even before that have just been amazing and it's interesting to see how artists different kinds of artists have been using technology interestingly in their work uh and then of course online spaces as as spaces for support to build communities as spaces for empathy and care um and responding to social issues i mean those things are great um i i also feel like um uh, It, you know it's also been useful to build uh, or facilitate collaborations across borders now you don't uh, you're not restricted by geography in that sense um and i think that it's important for the indian or south asian context to think about how it can grow uh, because obviously i mean we don't uh, not everyone has access to technology and uh, still right so uh, it's important for cultural institutions to also think a little bit about that and how to make it more accessible and more inclusive yeah any examples that come to mind that you know you sort of found exciting in the uh, digital space 
Uh, so actually, I mean, this is something that my colleague at uh, Asia Society was a part of, and it's called Art Chain India. Um, and that was a, 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 an initiative that started in the pandemic, as far as I understand. And <clears throat> it was basically a group of people uh, who are in the art sector. They came together and it's different people, curators, writers, um, uh, arts managers, artists. And they came together to create this online platform, which would support artists uh, in a, um, to, to, you know, do things like write artist statements or to be able to present their work, to be able to connect with galleries, because a lot of the times that is the gap. Right. Uh, you know, and so people can't, uh, they don't have the cultural capital necessarily to, to uh, make those connections. Right. And um, so I thought that was a really great initiative because uh, it also offered, you know, um, uh, peer-based reviews of things. So it, it, it started online, it has remained online, there's no, uh, and it's completely non-profit, I mean, people do it uh, in their own time, but basically it brings the, the arts community together and you can, whoever wants to contribute in whichever way can. Um, wow. So I think that was that was great. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. I actually haven't I hadn't heard of that. So thank you for <laughs> that. Um, there has been a long term and purposeful move away from traditional one size fits all, like you said, right? Um, towards providing unique and distinctive experiences, often with audience participating and guiding the experience. Um, have have you really come across any such initiatives where you know audience engagement has sort of um, been more? Um, so I think, um, I mean, I think the Museum of Art and Photography map in Bangalore, which is opening in December, um, it's been operational even without a museum building. Again, a great example of how one can do that. Um, and that I, uh, has been doing very interesting things with audiences. And it has different groups of people, I understand, in their team that um, uh, do uh, different kinds of programs or curate and present different kinds of programs for different types of audiences. So they have, a, they have a, some sort of very general um uh, did you know kind of material that they've made available about the collection they also have public talks and things like that which they do which are slightly more academically minded uh, they do a whole bunch of workshops which are in person in bangalore there's also the map academy which is you know creating this big encyclopedia so it's very research driven which is uh, uh, wonderful so i think those are those are very interesting ways in which that's being done um uh, but i think uh, i think what I feel personally, and maybe this is controversial, but I also feel like this becomes so there's so much emphasis now on being unique and distinctive that that has become the rat race. Um, and I feel like people are just in this rush to do things quickly, to be the first ones who do it. And that's not a symptom just of the art sector. It's just life in general, I believe. Uh, but I think it's really important to slow the pace down a little bit and to focus on quality over quantity to, uh, if you're engaging with a topic or a particular art form or a particular uh, type of programming uh, series, continue with it for some time and, and see how it develops and learn along the way and build it and, and keep adapting it to changing circumstances because I feel like that and maybe that's a quality of I don't know academia or I don't know what but um, I think that slowness needs to come back a little bit um, so that you don't feel like you're in this rush to get everything done immediately because there is no rush in that right. sense yeah. um, and you know collaborate like you don't you don't have to do everything by yourself find people who are already doing it or institutions and work with them work together um, yeah. Uh, work towards you know the, uh, similar goals basically and use what you have if you have a small team uh, make, make sure that you make the best of your small team uh, so that they are not um, uh, feeling like they're all over the place if you if you're a big institution with lots of people divide those uh, groups up and see what what more you can achieve um, uh, think about you know other stakeholders connected to the organization so so think about who your funders are think about who who are the people that you engage with uh, to um, curate programs or who are participants in programs and then think about audiences so I think there's a little bit of that critical thinking that is required um, and the unique and distinctive experiences will come as a result of that yeah, yeah. I think for me, uh, uh, during the pandemic, it, the best part was how each each museum was engaging with audiences in a different way. Even mm -hmm. organically, museums collaborated together to, you know, sort of 
uh, do these uh, movements like museum at home for example yeah, exactly. it's a great idea uh, where people would uh, you know talk about uh, how what in their home could be a museum object right Absolutely. so uh, so yeah and things that could be uh, i think there was a museum uh, what would a pandemic museum look like so you know people who kept uh, sharing what their uh, idea of association with pandemic was so i think uh, audience so is also now are uh, you know sort of engaging more because of online platforms and availability access uh, so exactly. that's really interesting right now yeah uh, what do you think about the disconnect and gap between museums and other cultural institutions in terms of engagement what do you not see uh, why do we not see more collaborations in the culture space which museum in india do you think are able to successfully bridge this gap um so i i'm not entirely sure um uh, how big the gap is uh, i just feel like maybe because museums have traditionally had such a specific mandate that there's a, a feeling that possibly you know you can't kind of you you have to stick to that mandate and you're kind of siloed into that um but having said that i feel like the gap is more between you know public and private institutions for instance yeah, there's a huge yeah, gap uh, that's a big one and i feel like whether that's museums or other cultural institutions that is the case yeah. um uh, or even you know institutions in in the four big cities versus the smaller cities uh, because there are i mean there are museums all over india there are so many museums but we don't even know half of them because uh, they are smaller they are more community driven they focus on very, very you know much smaller things um so i think those are the gaps and and i feel like you know if there's a way to kind of um uh, i i think the public and private thing is a is an ongoing debate it's been going on for years and i don't know what the answer to that is but i think that's a really big one and i think that no matter you know which government is in power or what the political situation is it is important for public and private institutions to work together and for that gap to close and um uh, i think it will benefit the sector as a whole right um what do you think could be the long term strategy for developing interaction between public and cultural organizations how do you see the engagement of cultural institutions evolving in the next 5 years in the indian context public private partnerships <laughs> back to this but um yeah i think uh, i think you know it would be good if the public se sector is more uh, receptive to innovation to creativity to the importance of culture both monetarily and other and infrastructurally um and of course that's an age old uh, story but but also to you know to be inclusive um in in the mandates uh, they follow um and similarly for private players to uh, uh, to be more expansive in what they want to achieve um and to uh, and and i think both both sectors uh, need to focus on getting good people into these institutions so we need to um, we need to rely on experts you know and nowadays i feel like for instance the word curator is overused and misused everyone's a curator but oh, it yeah. it means something very specific and and you know and uh, there there's a movement away from art historians uh, but there's a certain quality and and robustness and rigor that art historians bring to uh, cultural institutions museums or otherwise and so i think that making sure that you know there are there are good and one could argue that there aren't enough training programs in india for for cultural work not just art history but even otherwise uh, maybe that's one thing that needs to be done and maybe that will bridge uh, you know those gaps and maybe that 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 is how cultural institutions will evolve over the next 5 years if we have the training programs maybe people will uh, uh, participate in them more and and we'll get better people to work in these institutions speaking of training programs i feel like even the training programs need to evolve to you know facilitate the kind of audience engagement that we are talking about like for example i don't think any uh, uh, museology course in india talks about uh, uh, brand management but brand management of a cultural institution is a big part of what you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, cult uh, cultural entrepreneurs do or um, the people curators do even so uh, uh, i think that also has to sort of evolve with time and that is a big uh, you know expanding the curricula of arts management and mm -hmm. including 
subjects which are also making it interdisciplinary uh, you know uh, as we were have been talking about throughout exactly so, yeah, yeah um, uh, uh, what can museums learn from other type of organizations in terms of finding ways to build a positive and productive model for audience engagement do you think um so i don't know if uh, i'm the right person to answer this uh, having not been a museum professional but um i mean having collaborated with museums i think uh, if uh, more museums are open to those kinds of collaborations that that would be great because i feel like um other cultural institutions have uh, uh, very different um priorities but some of them may overlap with what museums want to achieve and so if there could be and what happens is that when you bring uh, cultural institutions uh, when they collaborate it's almost like double the power right you bring visibility from both sides you promote it at both levels and and so it grows it becomes a snowball sort of effect and so i think that that would be a, a great way to kind of uh, expand on what museums do um and the other thing we discussed and which i think is happening a lot more um is about if people are not coming to museums you take museums to people and there are ways to do that it doesn't have it doesn't require a physical infrastructure you can uh you can you can display or disseminate what is in a museum uh in spaces that are not in the museum at all and whether it's through technology or whether it's through public programs workshops um anything yeah I, i it's also the perception of museums right like in in india i think most indians when they travel abroad are very happy to queue up outside museums and uh, you know uh, explore them but exactly. in india the, the people who uh, actually go to see the museum before dismissing it are are so few like for example i recently went to mclord ganj and um, i visited the tibet museum there it's mm -hmm. incredible what they've done uh, the way they've curated it the, they've used technology they've used uh, different uh, kinds of uh, display displaying methods made it interactive but the point and i've been talking about it to you know everyone i meet but none of the people who have actually gone to dharmshala or mclord ganj have ever even you know thought about going to a museum uh, in that yeah. space so it's also about changing the perception of people about museums and the whole experience museum experience and absolutely yeah that and i think also uh, thinking of culture um, in a slightly more diverse way uh where it's it's not something that is elite it's not something that uh, you know is uh, people shouldn't feel scared to engage with uh, culture beyond you know popular culture beyond film and yeah. um and i think there are moves being that are being made to do that uh, by arts professionals but also by people who are working with institutions um and i think um uh, i think you know as long as there's more kind of visibility to this topic um i think there's more a lot more that can happen right um i would like to invite our audience to uh, sort of put in their uh, questions in the comment section if they, there are any um well, but uh, we can continue our chat <laughs> till then <laughs> so so i am um, um it'll be great to know a bit more about uh, you know culture because uh, of course you started it and uh, sorry i'm i'm taking on the role of yeah no, 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 no. but it'll be um, i think it's such an interesting kind of organization because you guys do such different things as well oh. uh, so uh, you know how long did it take for instance the little um, games that you make uh, or the yeah. toys that you make for kids uh, how long does it normally take to develop those so it actually uh, it's it's a process at least you know 6 months to 1 year it takes to build each of our uh, you know products uh, but the whole idea is to make complex concepts of culture more uh, accessible more interesting more experiential for any learner learner of any age you know uh, and uh, make it memorable for people to sort of engage with culture and the interesting part about product development for us is that we are trying to sort of a use uh, you know available crafts uh, craft clusters but also engage with them it's to create these new products which is uh, it's always interesting you know because uh, to uh, you know we have to go with with new products new ideas to them and they are like but why do why should we do this but uh, you know but what we are trying to do is bring uh, the crafts from 
lifestyle segment to education segment and that's actually increasing the uh, whole uh, you know market for uh, craft products entirely you know so mm. uh that's one we're also what we're also trying to do is uh use content to create the community so we mm. have an app which uh you know uh, has quizzing on it uh you mm. have tournaments you have short format content we, we're also going to uh have uh, uh you know some ar element in the app um we also do these uh, heritage olympiads where you know people uh, they just people from across the globe participate you know indian diaspora is always interested in you know connecting with their culture and so it's interesting that uh, to know that you know this kind of content is in demand but the availability is is so less you know most of the content which is available right now is either for scholars or for people like you and i who are already interested in it but not for a general public to get interested and become heritage enthusiasts and that's right. what i was thinking about even when we were talking about collaborations right like what happens is that most most organizations they are competing for the attention of same set of people because uh, you know we, there are five people who are interested in arts or culture and you know it, uh, e the museums are also uh, vying for their attention uh, cultural institutions also but the uh, with collaborations what you can do is sort of big, make the pie bigger right and get more exactly, people yeah. <laughs> to be in that pool of people so uh, i think that's what we are also trying to do we um uh, with respect to museums we do we also and in our product line uh, we create products uh, which are inspired by museum collections so for example uh, one of our products is uh, inspired by the national museum harappan gallery uh, right. it's uh, the dancing girl statue so you know you, you, it, it's very interesting that so many people actually go and uh, you know go to the museum the museum shop and ask for replicas and there aren't any right <laughs> you don't have souvenirs in india in from museum so that's what we are also trying to create um so work with museums to develop uh, souvenirs or things for their museum shop uh, that's also something that culture does so a little bit of everything <laughs> but yeah great yeah i think it's also really important um, and this is something i've noticed you know when people are developing things in cultural institutions is that uh you need to uh, do your research before you start something in terms of what is the gap and are yeah. you really are you just adding to the noise uh vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular type of program or are you really addressing a gap in the sector and i feel like especially when it comes to the crafts there's always this you know everyone wants to kind of jump in but what does the craft sector really need um you know uh, and and so that's one thing and also then to be able to after you've successfully in um uh uh implemented or delivered some set of programs to be able to track uh its uh, uh track its success or to right. or to analyze it and to do some sort of you know audience development or something like that i think that that's really important because um it's only then uh you can grow and expand and learn um and not make the same mistakes again <laughs> right you know uh, with uh, so i work with sahapedia uh, sub uh, time back and there they did a st market study to see what kind of audiences uh, you know engage with the platform and uh, what they found which was really interesting to everyone because the platform was for scholars or at least a post graduate level student and uh, Mo a lot of parents were using the platform and they were uh, you know using the content to teach their kids about culture and heritage and that's a segment of audience that you know was completely you know they had not even thought about so it is the data analysis like you're talking about which mm -hmm. will lead to organizations doing better uh, work or you know engaging in a better manner absolutely we have a few questions um uh, So Ashlyn Matthew asks uh, art and museums are generally seen as inaccessible and slightly elite to most in the in this country do either of your organizations work to engage with schools or bring art closer to people uh, if not is there something you would propose to your organization you can start <laughs> <laughs> sure so um so i think uh, given so 
Asia Society is not a museum, and so we don't have our own collection in that sense. Um, so it's it's not like we uh, uh, our mandate is not really to bring art, quote unquote, uh, um, uh, and make it accessible to people because that we don't have that that as part of. Uh, something that that is you know in our control but what we do is again um, become a facilitator or a mediator and so uh, our um, uh, focus is to present perspectives on the arts um, and the cultural sector and that could mean uh, anything it could mean um, access to art directly which will be done through collaborations with um, museums like the one, the, the exhibition that we've done right now. Um, and our role in that would be to then amplify the exhibition uh, in within our kind of networks and also globally because we're a global organization. So it places the spotlight on the work that is done in India. Um, uh, and it could also mean, you know, looking at things like cultural policy or looking at things like private collections or, um, um, you know, uh, curating these, uh, you know, cultural caravans, for instance, um, thinking about capacity building. So those are those might be considered tangential when you think about the gap literally between the person and the artwork. Uh, but I think that that is basically what Asia Society, uh, Asia Society's role is. And um, uh, I don't think, uh, I think we, we also don't claim to be anything else. Um, and so I think that's also a very interesting app uh, also, right, which basically has presents podcasts and yeah, uh, so that is something that I worked with. So um, uh, that's not linked to Asia Society, uh, but basically it's called ASAP Art. And that that's an app that I contributed to uh, briefly. And it's, um, uh, it was founded by Raha Balana. And it's basically an app which has short form content on uh, uh, lens based practices and media from South Asia. So again, yeah, a great aggregator wow. um, and uh, that makes also that makes things accessible to people who may not be able to even uh, physically visit it due to geography so if there are you know uh, there was a whole series that they did recently on the Dharamshala International Film Festival mm -hmm. and they had somebody go and report on the films there and write about them um, so that's a different kind of scholarship and I think that that's also super uh, you know it's super important and I think it's a combination of these things and which is why the collaboration aspect becomes so critical is because when you see each of these in isolation you feel like oh, maybe it's not enough but when you see everything together these institutions are all um, uh, moving the sector forward right even my organization uh, to answer the question works with uh, different audiences including schools and uh, students uh, under uh, the uh, you know in k12 segment we do uh, products of course for you know teaching kids um, uh, these concepts but we also do experiences you know we uh, conduct experiences for schools uh, we recently we are going to do an air uh, fest uh, experience festival with airbnb in goa around the same time with the serendipity Art, arts festival actually actually and um specifically for students uh, or schools uh we do programs and workshops uh, e uh for a uh, for uh, university students we do arts management courses and workshops so yes our organizations do does try to engage uh you know students um as much as possible um uh i think prabhu vishwanathan says i think a uh, key the key is to mystify arts itself i often overhear adults saying my three-year-old can do that while speaking about gaps between artists and galleries of private and public partnerships the biggest gap is that the arts community and the man on the street arts is simply not understood one suggestion is to teach arts in schools and what do you suggest can be done going forward <laughs> So um, uh, thank you for this. Um, and I've heard that from a lot of people as well, <laughs> uh, that uh, anyone could have made this. Um, but I think the question is not so much about mystifying the arts. I feel like the more people engage with art, I think we underestimate audiences. And that happens even in, you know, when we look at, uh, when we talk about, say, uh, Bollywood films or whatever, <clears throat> we think that we know better uh, than the audiences. But people, when they engage with art, have very instinctive uh, and very real responses and none of them are wrong um, and that's the best part about art but I do agree that education and thank you for bringing that up is a huge uh, part of a, you know, and a huge change that needs to happen where art needs to be taught um, at a primary secondary and upwards level um, both the practice of it and the history of it I think that there are um, uh, and of course arts management etc which comes later but I feel like you know just fine art practice and 
art history. Those are very, very important things that need to start uh, being um, part of our formal educational institutions. Yes. So, uh, and you know, one of my colleagues was talking about how do you identify different styles of miniature art, right? And this is something very simple that can be taught at a, you know, uh, at, at school or, you know, uh, at a very young age, which will make uh, say Kangra style or, you know, uh, Madhubani more interesting for a student when they actually see it or experience it. And uh, that's something that has never happened i think we don't we talk of we say that okay there is this craft this is the state where it it's from but how do you engage with it more right and that's something that we haven't done at school levels so far but i think that's something that we should look into um as well uh rachel isaac uh, says hi Katie. firstly thank you for sharing your journey with us i really liked what you said about needing to slow down and refocusing on collaborations or just doing it first uh, my question is how does one transition to that pace especially in the age of social media where uh so much of it is about lightning uh, speed uh, uh about speed right how do we push out meaningful content in the arts that could initiate sustained conversation I'm sorry if you have addresses. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, great question. I think um, it is tough. Um, and I feel like, it, it, you know, it sounds really simple to say you, you just have to not give in to that impulse. But honestly, I think institutions need to collectively not give in to that impulse. And what that means is, um, uh, is to, uh, is to balance it, maybe to begin with, to, uh, to balance it a bit so that you have, say, one focus area that you dedicate a lot of time to and do it at a slower pace and say that, okay, this is something that I want to culminate right now. It's the end of 2022. I want this project to be realized at the end of 2024. Um, that is my goal. So I'm not, I don't have to do it like tomorrow. Right. Um, and you supplement that with stuff that maybe you can do faster. So supposing you want to present, um, uh, an awareness building campaign on social media. That is something that possibly you could do a little bit faster. So you do that, but you also work on this on the side. And that's a, that's a better way to start because then you see the results of it. Um, I think also what, uh, and maybe this is not directly connected to the question, but I just want to point out that our cultural sector um, is is quite disorganized. Um, it has become more organized over the past, over the years that I have worked. But uh, I've noticed that a lot of young people are uh, always kind of moving between institutions, right? And I feel like the reason that that happens is because one, because of this pace and because you're constantly in under this pressure. But because of that movement, no one person actually ends up sticking around long enough to see that two-year uh, project in action, wow. right? So I think that cultural institutions and top leadership at cultural institutions need to put that down as an important mandate for the institution so that it becomes something that is relevant for also your team so that your cultural workers are not um, uh, kind of uh, uh, burdened uh, by the pace. And um, once institutions start doing that, the more they do it, the more it's um, it will grow, I think. And obviously, some institutions have the luxury of doing it. So if, you know, if they're private institutions that have a lot of funding, but I feel like then it should start there, uh, you know, and, and maybe those things will, um, will make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have one more question. Uh, Minakshi Vishesh says, Hello, uh, thank you for such an informative talk. Ketki, as you spoke about the need for more and more public-private collaborations now, could you cite an example of a public institution opening up to this as most of them have been comparatively closed in sharing their uh, research, outcomes, documentation, etc.? Mm. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, one example um, that has been successful uh, in the past is the Bhavda Jilad Museum in Bombay, um, which was run, I don't know what it, uh, what the situation is right now, but uh, it, it ran as a public-private partnership. I think it was between um, <clears throat> Intac and an industrialist, I'm forgetting exactly who it was. <clears throat> and so, so I, I, but basically it was an intact itself is, is uh, the product of a public 
private partnership. So I think that that is an example where it has uh, run successfully. Um, and the Bhadaji Lad has been become such an important institution in the landscape of Bombay. And um, it, you know, it continues to do uh, incredible work. And so I feel like there are opportunities like that. Having said that, of course, yes, I agree with you, Minakshi. Um, there are, uh, you know, public uh, institutions or the government in general um, has been uh, 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 not very forthcoming with its um, research or its uh, material. Um, and I feel like that is something that needs to be pushed for um, because uh, that is the only thing that will make uh, the cultural sector richer and make it grow. Uh, I think we've addressed all the questions now. Uh, thank you so much, Ketki. This was a really uh, fun talk uh, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad, uh, you know, we could do this. Um, uh, we, I'm, uh, Center for Museum also is uh, works with museums as a, a consulting partner and I'm hoping that, you know, we could do something together with, uh, uh, you know, your organization at some point uh, as Center for Museum or Culture. But yeah, thank you. Absolutely. For thank you for inviting me and uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Yeah. <laughs>